Chapter 17 Integration Ten days after their first evening with the survivors, Abigail and the three cherubs had begun spending most of their free time either visiting the commune or involved in survivor activities. Abigail began what Elliot described as a personal journey into the ocean of love. She listened to survivor CDs and watched videos during the day. In the evenings, she drove out to the commune and attended either the single parents group or one-to-one -one counselling sessions with Elliot. She also began doing volunteer fundraising work, canvassing for money in the city centre. On the occasional evenings when Abigail wasn't attending the commune, Elliot would usually phone her for a prolonged conversation and once even dropped by the house for a surprise visit. Dana kept up her role as the difficult recruit. The unfortunate 17-year-old chaperone who Dana questioned mercilessly got replaced by a middle-aged woman made of sterner stuff. Elliot suggested that Dana undergo an intensive counselling program to deal with emotional and hostility issues. Abigail agreed and wrote a cheque for $780 worth of therapy. The sessions were designed to make Dana feel good about herself, while subtly introducing ideas about the survivors' beliefs and the supposed benefits of their lifestyle. Her scepticism was a ploy to make the Prince family's integration into the cult more credible. But it wasn't meant to seriously hinder the mission, so Dana allowed the counsellor to win her over and received her leather necklace a week after the others. Lauren made plenty of friends of her own age within the commune. These preteen cultists had yet to master the manipulative recruitment skills possessed by older members, and Lauren had a relatively easy time. While Abigail and Dana attended counselling sessions, Lauren roamed around the disused mall. On a typical visit, she would meet her friends in the gymnasium or communal living quarters and tag along with whatever they were doing. Activities ranged from playing games to doing homework, or attending one of the many small religious services that took place every night. Lauren found many of the activities enjoyable, especially games in the gym and the happy clappy services with their chanting and dancing. But after the overpowering effect of her first visit, she carefully applied Miriam's thought control techniques. A few seconds thinking about the smell of James's laundry basket was enough to stop her from being overcome with euphoria. Because James seemed to be integrating nicely, he wasn't asked to attend one-on-one -on -one counselling like Abigail and Dana, but Eve and Ruth kept him under close supervision, even waiting outside the door when he used the toilet. They encouraged him to attend religious services and lectures about the teachings and life of Joel Regan. He visited the retirement home after school every day and often rode back to the commune with Eve instead of going home afterwards. Cherub mission controllers John Jones and Chloe Blake were staying at a hotel in the centre of Brisbane. Their role was going to be minimal until Abigail and the Cherubs were fully integrated into cult life, but they'd done some background research and one of the facts they turned up was that the North Park elder care community was owned and run by survivors. James gradually got used to the oldies on his daily trolley route. He was often asked to read out letters for residents with poor eyesight. He listened to them moaning about their ailments and the staff who looked after them. Many residents complained that they were being charged for therapies and outings that they hadn't taken and that bed linens weren't being changed. The plumbing was noisy, the water was never hot, and the air conditioning didn't work. James couldn't tell how much was genuine cause for complaint and how much was to do with the fact that the residents had little to do other than watch TV and find stuff to gripe about. Eve encouraged James to spend time with the residents. He came to realise that they looked forward to his brief visit every afternoon and they'd often set aside something they wanted to talk about. An article trimmed from a newspaper, their husband's war medals, or a photograph from their past. He found it disturbing, seeing pictures of residents who could barely shuffle across their rooms as teenage brides and bare-chested soldiers. James always spent more time with Emily than any of the others, 
usually 10 or 15 minutes. It was partly because she reminded James of his nan, but mostly because she was livelier than the other residents and often hilariously drunk. As Emily slugged back endless cups of milk mixed with vodka, she relayed a wonderful line in anecdotes about her son, whom she referred to as either the Dolt or Nugget Head. He'd apparently squandered a significant family fortune by setting up and bankrupting a discount airline, followed by a chain of DIY superstores. Emily said she was down to her last few million bucks. James particularly enjoyed the story of how Nugget Head had managed to nail himself to a sheet of plasterboard while demonstrating power tools inside one of his stores. Humiliated, he then chose to lash out at a laughing man who unfortunately turned out to be the Australian flightweight boxing champion. On the Friday, 13 days after his first visit to the commune, James stepped into Emily's room and found her listening to the words of Joel Regan through the speakers of a brand new mini hi-fi. Elliot gave it to me when he brought in my new towels and bath mats, Emily explained, anticipating James's question. I hope I'm not offending you, James. I know you're in with that lot, but it all sounds like a load of tosh to me. It was six when James got in from the care home. He went straight in the shower and came down to find Lauren setting the table in the dining room. Dinner was almost ready and James was visibly disappointed when Abigail came through with trays of overbaked supermarket cannelloni. Man, James grinned, the standard of cooking sure isn't what it was around here. Abigail smiled. I've not got time these days. I spent most of the morning with Elliot and three hours this afternoon stuffing promotional coupons into envelopes. What for? James asked as Dana came in and sat next to him. Abigail shrugged. It's one of Joel Regan's businesses, producing customised marketing materials for big companies. Elliot said they were short-handed and begged me to go over there and help out. Lauren shuddered. Oh, I've really gotten to hate Elliot. He's such a greaseball. Dana nodded as James helped Abigail dish up the food. Have you ever noticed that he seems to be in three places at once? Mary told me that Elliot only sleeps four hours a night, Abigail explained. Apparently, he was one of the top men at the Ark until he had a row with the spider. Now he's trying to get back on her good side by making the Brisbane Commune the most profitable in the world. James looked confused. The spider? Dana and Lauren spoke contemptuously and in unison. Regan's eldest daughter. Oh, James said. Don't you know anything? Lauren sneered. She's like the wicked witch of the West. Joel Regan is 82 years old. Everyone says it's the spider who calls the shots nowadays. As James pushed his fork down into his chicken cannelloni, Abigail noisily cleared her throat. <clears throat> James, how many times have I asked you to wear something over your chest at the dinner table? James tutted. I'm perfectly clean. I just showered and squirted myself with deodorant. I don't care, Abigail said sharply. I'm not sitting at the dinner table with you in your underwear. Go and put some clothes on. James wasn't in the mood for Abigail's obsession with table manners. Fine, he said, holding up his hands. I don't know what your problem is. Abigail snapped back. If you don't like it, James, make your own dinner. All right, Mum, keep your tampon in. I'll go and get a T-shirt. James stormed up to his room to get dressed. Three weeks in, the combination of school, homework, the care home, and the ever-increasing amount of time spent at the commune was wearing him out. He got back down and slumped into a dining chair, scowling at Abigail. Lauren tutted, unable to resist a dig at her brother. You're so immature, James. Lauren, I really don't give a shit what you think. 
James answered back. Language, Abigail gasped. God, Dana moaned. Will you shut up? I can't sit through another meal listening to James and Lauren pecking at each other. Abigail started to snigger as James took his first mouthful of pasta. What? Lauren asked. Abigail snorted. <laughs> it's funny, the way we've started bickering like a real family. The three youngsters smiled. Sorry, everyone, James said. I didn't mean to start biting people's heads off. I'm just stressed out. Apology accepted. Abigail nodded. Unfortunately, I think things will be getting worse before they get better. Elliot paid me a visit here this morning. He told me he thought we were making a valuable contribution to the survivors, and he invited us to move into the commune on a trial basis. James and Lauren grinned at each other, and even Dana managed a contented nod. I take it you accepted? James said. Grudgingly. Abigail said sarcastically. I said I thought it was too soon and that I wasn't sure I wanted to make that sort of commitment, but somehow he managed to talk me into it. Lauren laughed. <laughs> I bet he was looking around at this house, trying to work out how much money it's worth if we donated it to his commune. I know, Abigail nodded. He won't be happy when he finds out we're renting. <laughs> 